His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. I had a thought this morning, that is, we have a choice right now to make him Lord, or be, it'll be forced upon us at the great white throne judgment if we do not accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Uh, one way or another, everybody is going to bow their head and bend their knee before Jesus Christ. Everybody. On the, the, of all times around the world, everybody. And uh, so you got a choice. You can do it now, or you can do it at the great white throne judgment, just before you're cast into the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Those are sobering thoughts, and, uh, but they are from the Bible. And uh, it's something, it's not what I'm preaching on today, but I just got thinking about that this morning. I, everybody, I mean, he's the Lord of all. And I get to call him Lord and Savior right now and mean it. And that way, when I see him, I see him not just as my Lord eventually when I go into eternity, but he's also my Savior. And boy, what a friend we have in Jesus. But I tell you, if you're not saved, he's not your friend. There's a, there's a, a philosophy that's been going around for, for I don't know how many years, all my life, maybe th- since day one, that Jesus Christ is everybody's friend. He's not everybody's friend. But he will be everybody's judge. And he wants to be everybody's friend. He wants to save everybody. But that's up to you, the individual. That's up to you. And so that's why I think one of the things we have to see is the importance of the, the church that we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at a saved church membership. And uh, I, I know a common question that goes out, and that is, is, where is your church located? A lot of people say, well, where is your church located? You say, you know, I go to, I go to church here or something. Well, where is that located? And, of course, what, what they're, they're expecting uh, is an answer where we would say, well, here's the address. You know, we live over this part of town or the, this street and stuff like that. And by now, we, we fully understand that the church is not a building. Amen? It's not a building. It's, uh, it, that sometimes gets confused, and that's okay, but it, it, we need to clarify it. It's not a building. It's not a geographic uh, address that you can pinpoint on the map. A uh, church is, uh, is a fellowship of people, uh, special, unique people, and who are voluntarily associating together. It's a, it's a fellowship uh, uh, comprised of, of this unique, uh, this unique uh, co- uh, community of people. And perhaps a better question is, is where does your church regularly meet for services? That's really the more accurate one. Uh, the, the, this is where we meet, folks, but uh, the church itself is people. and We're going to look at that today, but a special type of people, because some churches don't get that right scripturally. And uh, yes, the church is made up of unique individuals. It's not made up of, uh, of brick and mortars, and, uh, but that leads to further questions. And, um, for example, what is so unique about these individuals? What's so unique about us? What's so different about us here at Forest City Baptist Church? What, what is this that, why are we here, and why are we members, and why? why? So you look at yourself in that way, that, that's a question. The other one is, who should be admitted into the church as a member? These are important questions. Um, uh, thus, we, we enter into w- another one of uh, the Baptist distinctives that we're going to look at. And uh, if we go to the next slide there, we've looked at these all summer long here. But I want you to understand in this week, we're going to be looking at the fact that uh, the church is to be made up of saved members, church members. Um, most churches around the globe, believe it or not, do not adhere to this distinctive. Most, many, 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 many millions of people who are members of a church are not saved. It's, it's sad, but it's true. And they, they, they encourage it. They let it in. It, it happens. They do not believe uh, in the doctrine of having a saved church membership. Or at least they do not define the term saved like we do. And uh, so there's a lot of churches that do that. So there's a lot of things that in all these Baptist distinctives that, that we say, oh yeah, it just makes sense. We understand this because we've been around for a while. But again, we need to stand, know why we stand where we stand. We're going to look at some scripture in a bit about that. And we need to understand that most of the people who are Christian, so-called, so-called Christian, you, by the way, you can be a Christian and not saved. You say, you, you're not a born-again Christian, but you can be a Christian. In other words, you can say, well, I, you know, I do believe that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, there's a lot of people that sing uh, the great Christmas carols, and they meet it you know, when they talk about uh, Christ's birth and stuff like that. But they personally have not been transformed by the renewing that comes through Jesus Christ. 
And that's what's lacking in a lot of churches today. And sometimes we're going to look at this, even sometimes that can creep into Baptist churches. We're not immune from that. But there are whole-fledged churches out there that don't care whether a person's saved or not. It's all about this, 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 what they can do for the community. And they have all kinds of worthy purposes uh, that are temporal worthy purposes. But they neglect the most important, and that is the salvation of the soul. I mean, what good is it if all we could do, and this is the one thing, is God, and I've looked at other verses in the Bible where God tells us that he has government, human government and stuff like that for our benefit, but really, governments can never, can never be an instrument for getting people into eternal life. They can help us out a lot in the, the here and now, and praise God for having a good government here and there, but uh, they can't get anybody saved. But the church has been responsible, not we can't get people saved either, Jesus Christ saves people, but we can lead them to the Lord. I don't know too many governments that will actually lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Because there's a competition there. If Jesus Christ becomes Lord, they lose some power, at least they think they do. And so there's always a power struggle. And we'll look at that in a few weeks too, uh, how that happens. But most churches around the globe who consider themselves to be of the Christian faith, uh, do not believe in this doctrine of having a saved church membership or a regenerate church membership. Uh, yet there are many non-Baptist churches that do. Okay, so we're not the only ones that believe that a person needs to be saved. There's other churches that believe that too. But this is a, one of our hallmarks of being a, a, an independent Baptist. Um, this is very important. It's a very important one to defend and to understand why we need to have this. So the first thing I want us to see, we'll go, the first question that comes up when I look at this today is, who should be a member of a church? And if you got your Bibles there, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. The, the good news is, and in all of these Baptist distinctives, the answers are in Scripture, okay? And uh, these Baptist distinctives are really just pulled out from good old-fashioned Bible doctrine. So Acts chapter 2, verse 36, let's take a look at some things. This is, therefore... Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's the Messiah. Now, I think that's interesting because a lot of people come up to the question, who, who crucified Christ? Was it the Romans? Was it my sin? Was it that? I like, it's already answered in the Bible. Let's look at it again. First, verse 2, verse uh, Chapter 2, verse 36. Again, Peter's preaching here to Jews. That's all he's preaching to is Jews. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. He goes, this is definite. That God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified. Yeah. Answers it right there. Jews don't like that. By the way, the Jews are not, uh, my daughter used to do a lot of uh, Jewish ministry uh, in, in California and when she was going to college there. And she, that was what she did every Saturday, went knocking on doors, talking only to Jews, only to Jews with Jewish material. They hate Christians. Don't kid yourself, unless they're a nominal Jew who doesn't care about religion at all. I'm talking about an Orthodox Jew. They might shake your hand. They might say, oh, you know, that's great for you. They hate Christians because they hate Jesus Christ. And that's not every single Jewish person, obviously. I'm talking about these de dedicated, devote Jews. Because this statement is in our Bible. They don't adhere to the New Testament, only the Old. But in our Bible, it says right here, now, the person who's preaching here is Peter. What nationality is Peter? He's a Jew. This is a, it's hard for me you know, to say, oh, Mike, we tell you you're not a Jew. How did, a Jew said this under the inspiration of God, not me. Okay? But this is something when people say, was it the Romans that didn't know? The Roman, if you remember, actually, even the Romans, they didn't really didn't want to do that to Jesus because they couldn't find anything in him. It's like legally, we find nothing for him to be guilty of. And it was the Jewish, not necessarily Jewish comic people, but those Jewish leaders, those hypocrites that said no. And then the average person, the crowd, remember the week before, who, who on Palm Sunday, who was throwing out all those palms and taking the shirts off their, or the, the clothing off their back and throwing it before him as he comes in on a donkey and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, you know, here comes the Messiah. The same people were saying, crucify him, crucify him. Let, let Barabbas go. Let, 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 let the scum of this earth, the people that don't care about other people's lives, let, let him go free. This Jesus, we will not have him, 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 him Lord over us. 
That's serious matters, folks. So there's a lot of issues here with the Jewish race, and yet, if it wasn't for the Jewish race, we wouldn't be sitting here today. So that's an interesting thing. Because the same type of people, the same people were saying, crucify him, crucify him, many of them got saved. And they were the forerunners, uh, the founders really under, under the, the, the headstone of, of Jesus Christ, uh, the founding member of Jesus Christ. They're the, the ones that are forerunners for us today. So it's kind of interesting how God can take people who at one moment are, are right here in Scripture said, you're the one that crucified, you put them to the cross, and yet Jesus Christ said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. What a heart. What a Lord. What a Savior. So yes, if it wasn't for the Jewish people, we wouldn't have our Bible. If it wasn't for the Jewish people, we wouldn't have our Savior. This was all God's design, okay? And we wouldn't have churches today. So I look at this, but I just, and this is, you're going to say, what's that got to do with the saved church membership? Nothing other than the fact that these people at one time, just days before that, hated this, this Jesus Christ. But some of them, some of them heard the preaching of Peter, and they opened up their hearts, and they looked at the Old Testament Scripture, they listened to what he was saying, and they had to agree. You're right. The man that we put to death, that we, and they, they, they took it. They took it. You're right, Peter. The man that we put to death. And they took it on themselves. See, that's the one thing about being saved. That's why a lot of people don't get saved is because of pride. Stinking pride. That's what keeps people away from, go, from an eternity in heaven with, Lord, with the Lord and having joy on earth. And, and that's what sends a lot of people to this lost eternity, this horrible, horrible eternity. It's just because of pride. They just will not fess up and say, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm a sinner. But these people did. These people did. So verse 37. Now, when they heard this, what do you think they did? They were angry and they ran on Peter and, the, and those disciples and they killed him? No. When they heard this, remember the Holy Spirit's at work here. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, you see their fellow Jews, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's all we need to have a strong, vibrant church, is somebody who will just take the Word of God, open it up, and say, Lord, you're right. You're right. I'm wrong. You're right. What's my correct correction for this? And just humble ourselves. That's what they're doing. Verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent! Repent, okay? We've looked at these, these words before, and that means having a change of mind where you turn toward God and leave everything else behind. He says, leave it all behind. Leave your Judaism behind. Leave all your stinking pride behind. Leave everything behind. Turn to God. Turn to God and be baptized. Well, what's so important about baptism? Baptism pictures the death, burial, and the resurrection of who? Jesus Christ. Repent from your sins. Go to God and accept His Son. The baptism proves that you've done that. It shows outwardly what you've done in your heart. And he says, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the thing is, and this is talking about it being a saved, having a saved church membership. One of the problems we have with a lot of churches is that they baptize babies and subsequently let babies into their church as far as so-called members and stuff of that nature. And you know something? It's possible to baptize a baby. My wife is a, came from an Orthodox Armenian church type, and they, they actually would baptize. They believe that the word baptism means what it means in the Greek. That means to immerse. So they, but they would take babies and immerse them. And that's how she was baptized as a baby. Me, I was an Anglican, and they sprinkled water on me. They didn't even get that part right. But at least the, 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 these, some of these, these churches get it right where you, it, baptism means to submerge or to immerse. But they would do it with babies. And the, the thing that I look at this, when I look at these verses here, is that it is possible to take a baby and submerge them underwater like we do adults or teenagers or anybody that, that, that has a conscious ability of what sin is. We could do that with babies, but it is not possible for a baby to repent. It's impossible. So when I, when I look at, at, at the command here, when, when you go back to it, he says, what are we going to do? And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. In other words, repent and then get baptized. It's so clear. But why are there millions, hundreds of millions of people who call themselves Christians around the world who won't just do what God says? Why don't they do this? 
They, they, they seek something else. And, and, but again, you can, you can baptize a baby, but you can't get them to repent because they don't understand yet. Okay, I'm not saying when a baby dies, they go to hell or even the limbo because they don't go, there's no such thing as limbo. It doesn't exist. Okay, it's not in the Bible. It's not in Holy Scripture, uh, inspired Scripture. It's not there. It doesn't exist. And a baby hasn't willfully done any sin. He has, has a sin nature, hasn't willfully sinned, and it hasn't had an ability to repent. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. And we learned that with David, King David when his baby died. He said, I, I, the baby won't come back to me, but I'll go to the baby. And where's David? There's no question where he is. Man after God's own heart, he's going to be back, and in, in, in I'm looking forward to the millennial. He'll be back. He's with God. So where's that baby? With God. There's so many things in the Bible that tells us the truth. So why do we make up limbo and why do we threaten people and scare people? If you don't get your baby baptized and, and get them into the church, you know, what, what are they going to lose their salvation or their salvation is going to be staved off a bit and we're going to have to burn a whole bunch of candles and pray and pray and pray to get them back in? What a bunch of hellish doctrine that's going around in churches. My greatest um, battle as a preacher it's not with the non-Christians. It's not with the Jews. It's not with the, the, the Hindus. It's not with the Muslims. It's with Christians who just do not know the Bible or will not submit to the Bible. Amen. That's the big... They, they propagate so much counterfeit out there. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's, it's one thing if, if, if a person's going to pay something and they get Canadian dollars and they put it down there. We don't use dollars much anymore, but if they were, I could say, oh, that's a Canadian dollar. And if somebody was going to come out there and, and they had something, uh, a peso, and, oh, that's a peso, because they're not counterfeit. They're two completely different things. I can get that. I can say, oh, that person's a born-again Christian and that person's a Muslim. I can see that. But then there's counterfeits in this world that are Christian but are not born again. They didn't come through Jesus Christ. They just believe he's God, but that's it. And they had those counterfeits, and those are very difficult to distinguish. That's what we're faced with, with a lot. So, the church is designed to be, as we're going to look at in a minute, for saved people only, to be members of the church. Again, there are a lot of churches that want to get your, your baby baptized because there's always that, that fear that they're going to go to hell or limbo or something like that. You find me, you show me the verse in the Bible. You show me one verse in the Bible. I'll go along with you. It's not there. It's not there. It's man-made religion at its finest. So nowhere in the Bible does it say that, uh, that, that does anyone join a local church without first consciously and willingly repenting. And again, babies, therefore, are not able to join the local church because they are not candidates for baptism. And you can't join a church scripturally until you've been baptized. Step after step after step. We're just looking at Scripture here, what the Scripture's saying. And the main reason that many churches push for infant baptism and subsequent church membership is because they link such things to a person's salvation. And as we learn from the writings of Paul and under inspiration, you can't add anything to salvation. Jesus Christ did it all. He paid the whole price, all of it. It is finished. Those were powerful words from Jesus Christ on the cross. It is finished. I paid it. Done. All you have to do now is repent and believe. Wow. And then we have churches this morning. Even right now, there'll be people up there and they'll be preaching away. And it's not, I'm not just talking about Roman Catholics. I'm talking about all, all kinds of types of churches. And they'll throw things in. I remember John Hagee. There's a lot of lies. Be careful. He's a counterfeiter. John Hagee. He'll, he'll tell you that the Jews have a special deal with God. The Jews do not have a special deal with God. They do not get a second chance. We're all even at the foot of the cross. You understand this, folks. We just read it here. I'll read it for you again. Look over there in, 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 in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Okay? And then you go back down there and they say, what should we do? Verse 38. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Do it now. There's no second chance for anybody. Once you die and go into eternity, that's it. You don't have a special deal because you're born of a, per, a, a particular race. Nobody gets a special deal. So we have these kind of preachers and that, and they let people in, and they say these people are okay, and these people are all right, these people, and we let these people in and stuff. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is the gatekeeper. We're going to look at that in a minute. He's the gatekeeper. He's the person that adds to the church. All right? Yes, we can vote. Yes, I can re recommend to you somebody for membership. But it, truly, it is God's church, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ who adds to his church. He knows who's his he knows who the imposters are. And there's a lot of fake preachers out there. We've got to be very careful. 
So let's go over to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Down there, verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Okay, they received his word. What was the word? Get, repent. They gladly received it, and they were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now notice in verse 41 that those who listened and responded to Peter's message by repenting and showing their faith uh, with obedience to baptism, which pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it was only those people who were added unto this church in Jerusalem. Only those people. Okay, They that gladly received this word and were baptized. Okay, they were the ones that were added to the church. So it's, it has to be a saved church membership. You can't let anybody else in as far as a member. Yeah, they can come into the service, but not as a member. These are things that we should understand. The phrase added unto them is referring to the apostles, uh, the ones who made up the first church. And if you, if, you don't, if you want some proof of that, look there, verse 37. Go back to verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto who? Peter and the rest of the apostles. That's who started up the church. Jesus said to his men, I'm leaving. You're going to start something amazing uh, here on the earth. Once I'm gone, and you're going to get the power of the Holy Spirit, which was happening on that, day, on that particular day. He says, and I'm going to start with you men. And so they preached. And the men heard it. And at least 3,000 people responded to it. So what should we do? And the Bible says that they did. They got saved. They got baptized. And they were added unto them. Who? Those apostles. So we know the church is real people. It's not brick and mortar. They weren't added to a building. They didn't have buildings back in those days. Not for churches. They didn't have special purpose buildings for that. But they were added unto a group of people. They knew who each other were. They knew who Peter was. They knew who all those other disciples were. They were, he said, men and brethren. They, they were looking at each other. They knew each other. They were real people who knew each other. That's what makes up the church. But they weren't just any people. They were people who had repented, got baptized, and then they were added. They were added unto them. It has to be a saved church membership. The church can, consists of real flesh and blood people who are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. In verse 44, we see again that it, it is only the believers in Christ who were gathered into these special, unique assemblies where they to have their services. And it says that they were, they were together. They believe, those that believed were together. Nowhere do we find that unsaved people who are in this assembly, uh, we don't find any unsaved people in this assembly. Not this particular group of, of people here. They were saved people. Um, it was between the believers of their community. Uh, we now call the local church. They had a group. They had all things in common. They joined together. That's kind of like what we do today. It's kind of interesting. You get to know each other. You get to know your names. You get to know, you get to know your, your quirks and your, your, your amazing parts. There's, there's amazing parts. Yeah, Doug, yeah, you've got some amazing parts. That's a beautiful shirt. Is that purple? No. No, okay. Man, I'm losing my eyesight. <laughs> but we get to know who people are. And sometimes, folks, when I preach, and I, I'll mention your names. So why? Because I know who you are. I can't help it. Because it's exciting to have people here. And not everybody likes me and agrees with me on everything. I get that. And uh, it's the way it is. But we know each other. And we have one thing in common. It's not me. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, he needs to be magnified and praised in the church. He brings people together. People from other walks of life. He, he, he can assemble all kinds of people together. And so he did this. They had these things in common. Now I'm sure in that group of 3,000 people, I'm sure there's some rich people there. I'm sure there were some middle class people there. I'm sure there were some poor people there. But it didn't matter. They had one thing in common. And it wasn't, that, well, it wasn't just because they were Jews either. It was because they responded to what was preached. And they agreed, you're right. We're sinners before a holy God. They did the right thing. Then they were baptized, and then they were added to the church. So it's kind of an amazing story here. Now, this verse 47 where it says, uh, if you look there at Acts 2.47, it says, Praising God and having pay, uh, favor with all the people. And here it is. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be what? Saved. saved. you got to be saved. 
So th this is the, the definitive verse in the Bible that supports the Baptist distinctive that you have to have a saved church membership. Because it says again, it says that there, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. He was looking for people who would repent and get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, his son. And then he's, oh, you're a candidate. Okay, I'll bring you into my church. He was doing this. This is an amazing thing. Now, uh, it, first, you have to notice there's a couple things here. First of all, in verse 47, that it was the Lord Jesus Christ who added to his church. All right? Christ is the founder and head of the church. And not only does he, did he start it, and not only is he the head, but he's the sustainer of the church. He's the one that brings people in. He's the one that adds people to the church. Now, th th this, uh, there is an example in the Old Testament. This is not unique. If you've got your Bibles, go over to Genesis chapter 6, verse 19. Genesis 6, 19. God sometimes works this way. God works in mysterious ways. God knows why he does what he does. He's God. He doesn't have to... Ex uh, to explain himself to us, but he, there's some things he, he does where he gets involved, where he actually participates. Genesis chapter 6, verse 19. We're looking back again to Noah's time, where Noah's building this ark, you know? He's spending like 100 years here building an ark. And in verse 19, during this time, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort. Now notice this. This is a command from God to Noah. He says, Thou shalt bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female. Oh, wait a minute. Where's the other genders? Don't, isn't there like 12 of them now? Where's the dual spirits? I'm throwing that in for free, folks. Verse 20. Of fowls, after their kind, and after, uh, of cattle, after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth, after his kind, two of every sort, now here it is, shall come unto thee, to keep them alive. Who's really adding into the ark here? It's God. Nowhere in Scripture, actually there's not a lot about Scripture, just about here, but nowhere is, while he's building this ark, he's not going out into the woods looking for two of every kind of animal. Because God says there, he goes, shall come unto thee. He goes, I'm going to send them your way, Noah. I'm going to send these animals, two of every kind, I'm going to send them. You see, God's getting, in. Well, why does God do that? Because God is God. God can do whatever he wants. He wants to get involved. He could have waited another 100 years and had him go out and get him. He could have done that, but God wanted to get involved. And he says, no, 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 no. This is, this is my design. The ark, by the way, is, is a picture of salvation. It was designed by God. He gave everything, all the dimensions and all the material that needs to be done to, to Noah. He said, I want you to be a part of this. But he goes, I, this is my, my salvation. I'm going to save you from the, the, this, this judgment that is coming. And he goes, and, and I'll start collecting for you and i'll bring them to you now what was the job of noah well noah was to, to go out there and wait for these and look for these and, and, and see them and when they would come to him he would either lead them onto the ark or i guess in some cases he might carry them onto the ark but it was god who did the actual adding it was god who did the choosing god who did the picking now when we look at the church when you when you look at all of this god brings people to us who are ready to be saved and added. I firmly believe that. He brings people into your path. People that, that's why we should always be ready to give an answer for what we believe. Because he, God's going to bring people. It, it might be in the, uh, the most unlikely spots. It might be at work. It might be walking down the street. It might be in, in a church building. It might be anywhere. But God will bring people. God's bring. I, I always kind of try, I, I try to picture it as like Noah. It's like we're trying to get people into the ark. Our ark is the Lord Jesus Christ. That was just a picture of the eternal salvation we get in a person, Jesus Christ. But God's going to bring people out of the world toward you, and they're going to be looking for answers, and they're going to be looking for somebody to, to direct them. God's adding them. He's looking, he, and he's letting us do that. He didn't, I mean, God could have created, poof, an ark, but he didn't. He wanted man to get involved, and he wanted to have a part of this, all right? The same thing with with building churches. It's God that does the adding. He's the one. He knows the one. He's the one that gets people saved. He brings people in our paths and he wants to use us. He wants to invite us into his ministry. What an honor. What an honor. That's why we need to be uh, praying a lot into his word a lot and we need to be able to be flexible to have his will be done in our lives because he wants to partner with us. He doesn't have to. He can, he can, he can cry out from the, the rocks, the stones that can preach. 
He can use a, a mule to preach. He can use anything to preach. He's inviting us into this. So I, I look at this and I think this church, this idea of church is exciting. And the idea that you have to be saved, it's exciting because that means sometimes not everybody that comes to this church stays. Not everybody that comes to this church gets saved, but a lot do. They, they come in one at a time. We need to be able to be ready. It's like, so be, be like Noah. Picture yourself like Noah when you see somebody new coming in here. It's like, because we don't know. Maybe, maybe God's brought you here. Either way, I'm going to give you uh, a, a, a welcome and share my, my life, my testimony with Jesus Christ with you. Because you don't know. But what I do know is that it's God that does the adding. God does the adding. God brings in, God does the adding. It says there in verse 47 that, uh, and the Lord added to the church. And as I said before, yes, I could present somebody to the church. This person's been saved, baptized, and you can all vote. And this is just for us to keep our records down here on earth uh, so you know who's a member and who's not a member. And these people want to come in as membership. But you know, it's God that adds. It's God that adds. I mean, who are we kidding? I mean, the very fact that I can even stand here today is because God's given me some strength. It's time to be a little bit humble and say, thank you, Lord, for letting us in partnership. And folks, I want to add something to you. It's not part of my sermon that how important your attendance in church is because you encourage other people. And it's, it, I can't say it enough. It, you encourage me, but you encourage other people as well. People think, oh, they won't miss me. Yeah, yeah, yeah they'll miss you. They'll miss you. I've been in, in mega churches. Even mega churches, they'll get to miss you after a while because they, they break people down into groups. They know when people, they know when a certain person. Everybody, it doesn't matter what big or small church. Everybody has, seems to have their same location that they're always in. I notice that there's their favorite. They get used to a certain spot, and uh, it, it's just that where, where they are. And when they're not there, you kind of notice something's wrong. It's kind of interesting. So it's really important the uh, the, the importance of a, of a church family. And being a part of God's ministry. So that's one thing we see there in, in verse uh, 247. But the other thing in verse 47, the second thing we get from that, uh, is that the Lord Jesus Christ only adds to his church those people who are, as they say here, the saved ones, such as should be saved. So if anybody asks you, can you prove that you know you, you got to be saved, it's right there in Acts 247. That's how God does that. And remember, babies cannot be saved until they're in a position to repent. They have to grow up. They have to get to a point where they understand sin. It's not just to understand that there's a God. They have to understand their sin. They have to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Don't rush to get children saved. But be important. It's the important thing is to get the word of God to those children as early as you can. But let God do his work. And let's kind of, let's make sure we, we just present, okay? But let God do his work. And let it be an amazing thing. So who should be a member of, the, of a church? Saved people. The second question is, are all church members saved? And this is a real loaded question, isn't it? Because uh, it, it's tricky because it's a yes and no answer. We just looked at the one uh, verse there, verse 47, where it says that he added, God adds to those who, who, who are saved. Uh, but if you hang around long enough, you find you'll have encounters with imposters. Okay, and I'm not talking about somebody who just comes to this church and isn't going to another church. Okay, I'm talking about there's people that come in, and they can even join the church. They can even get baptized. But after a while, they'll come and tell you, "Yeah, it wasn't for me. I was just trying it out, just trying it out." And I, I thought it was just like another faith. But you, have faith, but you know, I'm kind of over it now. And I've met those people. They're imposters. Okay. So can they join the church in, in, on that level? Yes, they can. Can they fool us? Yes, they can for a time. But if you've got your Bibles, go over there to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. We looked at this earlier in, in the summer. Hebrews 10, verse 24. I'll give you a chance to, to find it from Genesis. Hebrews 10, verse 24. Can imposters or can people be added to a church who are not saved? And the part of the answer is a yes and no answer. The yes is found here in Hebrews 10.24. And let us consider one another to provoke one unto... Excuse me, I'll try that again. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, 
but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, we've looked at that before. The manner of some is, and if you look at the, the previous parts in verse 10, or I'm sorry, chapter 10 and other parts of Hebrew, it's talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's talking about the old contract and the new contract God has with people. And there were Jews in those days who were Messianic Jews. They believed Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was God, but they weren't saved. And you say, can that happen? It happens all the time. I've just said it. At Christmas time, you're going to find all kinds of churches around the world are going to have uh, nativity scenes and they're going to be praising God and everything else, but they're not saved. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because I've talked to them. They don't even know what I'm talking about. They ain't saved. Well, I, I do this and I do this. No, no. Salvation is not something you do like this, that, and everything else. It's a person you received. It's Jesus Christ in your heart. Is he your Savior? Did you repent? Did, did you give it all over to him? Is he in you? Well, in, in, they don't fully understand. They don't get it. So, and there's so many that don't. So we see here in, in Hebrews 10.25 that there were people that were going to the church. And by this time, there were churches spreading all around. But this was the Hebrew church. Hence the, the book Hebrews, the Jewish church in Jerusalem. They were people that had gone and eventually said, no, it, I've tried it out. Yeah, I see you're, you're coming off with Jesus is, is God. I, I can see that the Messiah. I can see that. But you know what? I miss my family, my friends. I miss going back to the law because they grew up in the law. That's a very superstitious thing for them. By the way, there's a lot of people who go to hell today because of superstition. They got these superstitions. They, just, they kind of add God as he's kind of some kind of lucky charm. Jesus Christ is a lucky charm to them. And that's where they were kind of tried with that. And then they ended up going back. But I miss, I miss all the holy days that the Jews had. And they missed all their... And so some of them, the manner of some was, is that they tried it out. They assembled. They got saved, they got baptized, they were in there, and after a while, they said, nah, and they withdrew. And then the, the command here is, don't you be like them. Don't you be fickle in your attendance. Don't be like the manner of some is. And so, can, can uh, an unsaved person get into a church and join the church? Yes, they can. Uh, that's, that's one of the answers, uh, is that they can. And uh, this often happens, uh, uh, I mean... Uh, most notably, I see a lot of people will, will join a church. They'll get baptized. They'll join a church because they want to marry somebody who's a member of the church. You ever known anybody like that? I've known people like that. And, it's like, and they try to fool you. Oh, yeah, I got, yeah, I prayed a prayer, and I got in the baptistry take, and I'm going to join the church, and then I can marry this person. Happens a lot. They're imposters. Imposters, and eventually. And that's what I found here in, in Hebrews. Eventually, it comes up. They can't sustain it forever. Okay, eventually it, it'll come out. They'll either leave or, or something will happen. They'll have to be asked out. But that happens. A lot of things, sometimes it's children who are trying to pr please their parents or their Sunday school teacher. And they'll make this false profession. They'll pray a prayer, get baptized, join a church. And then later on in life, you find they have nothing to do with God at all. They turn it back on them. Really, that doesn't even bother them. No conscience, no Holy Spirit working on it, nothing. It's not there. They were trying to please a person. They were trying to, they were trying to tick off some boxes here and there so that they, they could get a certain thing. That was it. That was it. So that happens. It happens in Baptist churches a lot. And um, so in some ways, it is possible for a non-saved person to sneak into the church. But on the other hand, we must remember Acts chapter 2, verse 47, that it is the Lord who adds to the church. That's why I say that this question here, question number two, is kind of a loaded question. It's a tricky question. Because as far as we're concerned, you can fool me, folks. You can fool me, you can fool everybody else for a while, for a while, but you can't fool Jesus. And he knows who are saved and belong to his church. They, he knows, he knows, he knows, he knows. And so this is something that's important and that leads us to, uh, uh, to the, I guess, the third question, and that is, is there a place for unsaved people in the church? Is there a place for them? And, and to best answer this question, we must once again go back to Scripture for a definition of what a church is. And the most basic thing about a church is that a church is a local call-out assembly of baptized believers in Jesus Christ. It's a local called-out assembly of baptized believers in Jesus Christ. That's all it is. That, 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 that's a church, okay? Now, is there a place for the unsaved? Because all I've been going on and on and on and on about in this message is that you've got to be saved to be in, in this church. And the answer to this is that the church is not a building, is it? It's a particular people. Likewise, the church is more than just a ministry, more than just a service, okay? More than just a Sunday morning service. 
And sometimes we get confused and we think that the building is the church. Sometimes we think sometimes the Sunday morning church uh, meeting is the, is the church. It's not. This is just a, a service. So uh, what I'm saying in all of this is that there are opportunities for unsaved people, and I invite and welcome unsaved people to come to our services. Because this service is not just the church. It's where we preach and teach the Word of God. We as Christians need it so we can get built up in spiritual food so that we can grow and conform more into the image of Jesus Christ. But it's good to have and save people amongst us as well because they need it. So like those other guys, we can prick their heart and they understand that they need to get saved. Anytime the Word of God is preached and taught, anytime, it's good for everybody. I've never seen it being bad for anybody. It's always good for anybody. So let's make sure that we understand that this Sunday morning service is not the church itself. Yes, church members are here, but it's a ministry from the members. Okay? It's, it's a ministry. It's a, you've been praying. You've been singing praises to God. I, and you, you enable me to, to preach and to teach this stuff. And that's for you, but it's also for anybody that's unsaved. Welcome. Come on in. Listen to the truth. You need it because you're not going to get a lot of truth out there. The truth is of the Word of God. So yes, uh, we have to, is there a place for unsaved people in the church? Not as members, but as being a part of our services. And you say, well, is there a scripture for that? I'm glad you asked. Look to Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And I'm closing pretty soon, folks. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Maybe that's why they shut off the air conditioning. Is that what they do? They shut off the air conditioning so it gets really hot and I have to close off quick? Hmm... Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And they continued, continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Okay, th these are the members. These are the 3,000 people plus the apostles. Those people that got saved, baptized, joined the church. They didn't remember, they didn't have a, a special purpose building yet. But it's, they, So where did they go? They continued with one accord, yes, uh, in the temple and breaking and bread from house to house. So this is important. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God, and here it is, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So what they were doing is, yeah, the church members would have, they didn't have buildings, so they met in people's homes. They would meet from house to house and house and house and, 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 and that, so they would have that. But also they would have public services in the temple. Would well, you think it was just Christians that were in the temple? No, the temple was really made for Jews anyway. And you say, well, well, what was the purpose of them? Why would they meet all? Because for one thing, it was a, it was a great place for, for masses to meet together all at once. But at the other time, is that that's where you, when you preach to the church people, the unsaved Jews that were out there, they were listening too. And it's kind of important to understand that is there a place for unsaved people in a church, not in a church membership, but in a church? Yes, there is. Because uh, I, I think it's really important for us to understand that remember those 3,000 people that got saved and baptized on the day of Pentecost? They weren't saved when they showed up at the church service, were they? That was the first, very first church service. The Holy Spirit came. The birth of the church came. You have Peter and all the other, the other 10. Uh, there was, wasn't 12 yet uh, apostles. You had these men together, and they, they were preaching, and they were preaching to people who were not saved yet. And then they added them to the church. Well, then they took the whole group, and they went over to the temple. And they would just keep preaching. To the church members, yes. But also there was all other people out there too who were Jews who knew the Old Testament and they were listening. And they kept being added daily. So it's important for us to keep a welcoming, and it had favor of the community, as it says there. It's important for Forest City Baptist Church. And I, I hope you forgive me. And if you, have any, if you need clarification, come and talk to me. Because sometimes you say, well, man, he hates Roman Catholics. I do not hate Roman Catholics. Love Roman Catholics. My grandfather's a Roman Catholic. Loved him. And I saw that man get saved just before he died, okay? And I, 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 I've, I love uh, Jewish people. I love, uh, praise God, my Savior's a Jew. I just want you to understand that, okay? But I still have to preach the truth that's in the Scripture as well. But one thing we have to do is we have to try to do our best to, to, to make connections with people out in the world. And yes, invite them into our church services because they need to hear the truth. And that's our building blocks. And I think the exciting thing for me is I never know who's going to get saved. I never know who's going to get baptized. I never know who's going to join the church. Who's, what's going to happen this year? Think about it, folks. 
We're, we're, we're coming to the, to the close of 2022, and we're, we're going to be starting up in 2023 and stuff. We don't know what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Pray. We always think, oh, I don't know, maybe so-and-so won't be around. Maybe more people will be in here. Maybe people will get saved. Maybe there will be more amazing things happen. That's what I'm praying for. Amen. We need to pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you as we look at, uh, at this subject of a saved church membership, how important it is to realize that the church is yours. It's not ours. We're invited guests. We're, we're invited into it. We can become members of it. We thank you for that, Lord. But your uh, son, Jesus Christ, is the founder. He is the head. He is the leader. He's the sustainer. He's everything to this church. And Father, I just pray that you'd help us to appreciate the local church. And I'm thankful, Lord, that there are so many local churches around in the London area. I'm so thankful that there are genuine churches with born-again members all around here and that, Father, they're truly praising you and they want to get other people saved. And, Father, help us as we focus on our local church here. Help us to be praying for new people to come into this church. Help us to be like Noah. Help us to, to have, as we're building and doing other things, Lord, help us to always have our, our eyes open and looking for whatever you send our way, whoever you send our way to bring into the, into the fold. And Father, help us to be able to give them an answer for the hope that's in us. May that be in them as well.